Good morning. Before we look at the, the word this morning, I'd like to simply again uh, thank you all for your support and prayers uh, for us all these years. I was just trying to think how long we've been uh, supported and prayed for by this church. I think it goes back over 20 years now. Uh, we started back in 1997, first to go to language school, and I believe we're here at that time, and we just want to really thank you so much for your, your prayers and your support. Um, the Lord has ordained that through prayer, the work of the ministry goes forward, and it's, it's hard for us to, to think of that and to see how can that really work out, but it does. The Lord has ordained that prayer be a means by which the word goes forth. And uh, I know your pastor would appreciate and appreciate so much your praying for him, all the ministerial staff, um, praying for boldness and praying for laborers, um, praying for protection. Uh, these are all prayer requests that Paul gave. And he said, brethren, pray for us. And he meant it. And we do too. We do depend so much on the prayer of God's people. And we thank you so much for your prayers and your support as well all these years as the, the furtherance of the gospel. The gospel goes forward, and we thank you for your fellowship in the gospel as well. Uh, you are partners with us, and we do appreciate so much that. And we'll give an update of our uh, ministry in just a little bit after the service today, and we look forward to telling you and maybe showing you as well from a little media presentation uh, what the Lord is doing. This morning, I'd like to look at you, uh, with you a passage in the Psalms, and it's Psalm 8. The eighth psalm. This psalm begins with a recognition of the excellent name of our Lord, this majestic name, and it ends with that as well. And so, whether in heaven or on earth, God's name is excellent, it's majestic, it's above all other names. Uh, something's majestic when it's awesome, it's impressive. It's glorious. The French uses the word here, magnifique. You can hear the idea of magnificent. That's our name, the name of our God. It's magnificent. It's above all other names, and it's in heaven, and it's on earth. And he says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Notice how the first word even he uses, O Lord. There's a sense in which he senses God's awesome majesty, and he cries out to the Lord, and he, he addresses this prayer to the Lord. Actually, the whole psalm is addressed to the Lord, and so this is a psalm of David, and as we read through this psalm, I want you to notice the contrast that we see here between our awesome, majestic God and how he even reaches down to man. But also, this is a, a messianic psalm. I think if you read the psalm, you wouldn't just look and say, oh, yeah, I see a Jesus here. Uh, I think that's often happens in the Old Testament. We read through in the Old Testament and we kind of just read right over it. and We don't realize that Christ is being presented there in a number of ways. And this is one of those psalms. We do see the word son of man. That should help us. But what helps us to know this is a messianic psalm is the references in the New Testament that refer to this psalm. So let me read the psalm now, and you can follow along and look for those things as we read. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings, and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the work of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. One of the reasons I want to look at this psalm with you uh, relates back to what happened on July 12th of this year. This was the day that NASA revealed the first images from the James Webb Telescope. I don't know if any of y'all happened to see those images. Um, maybe some 
astronomy geeks are really interested in that kind of thing. I always like to look at what's going on there. You may remember the Hubble Space Images. Well, the James Webb Telescope is like supposedly 100 times clearer and better than that. And uh, on July 12th, President Biden was there to, pr to uh, present the unveiling of the first pictures that were taken from this particular telescope. This telescope is further out than the Hubble Space Telescope because it can pick up infrared light at, at uh, wavelengths that Hubble was not able to do. And um, so what, what happened when this first picture was, was shown, the scientists explained uh, galaxies galore in a grain of sand. And let, let, let's explain this. The picture is of a slice of sky that's the size of a grain of sand. So if you were to hold up a grain of sand and um, the amount of space that is covered by that grain of sand is what the picture was taken of. So just imagine a grain of sand on the sky and, uh, and, and just blown up now and imagine what they saw there, uh, thousands and thousands of galaxies with billions and billions of stars. And it really is amazing. Uh, Albert Einstein actually predicted that the number of stars is roughly equal to the number of grains of sand on all the Earth. And it would take Albert Einstein to kind of pr predict that kind of thing. Well, um, experts are now saying that it's probably 10 times more star than every grain of sand on the, the, um, on the seas of all the oceans, uh, on all the shores of the world. And that's really mind-boggling, isn't it? I was listening to a, a reporter actually uh, following this uh, revelation or the, um, uh, the pictures that, as they were revealed, and he just sat back and he talked to the NASA person and he said, we're nothing. We're nothing in all of this space. And the scientist was explaining, yes, four billion uh, light years away, you're looking at those foreground galaxies that are there. And he's thinking, you know, that's incredible. You know, we're nothing in all of that. And that's actually what the, the psalmist is saying here, too. You can think of David as he looked out upon the sky and he, he saw the Milky Way that was there. And actually, when you're looking at the Milky Way, what are you doing? You're seeing our galaxy that we're part of edge on. And so we're seeing the, the, the millions and billions of stars that, that make up the Milky Way is just our galaxy. And so, you know, the nearest galaxy is Andromeda. And then you go on to other billions of galaxies with billions and billions of stars. And it's just mind boggling. And this, like this, uh, this reporter, you look back and you think, wow. You know, in all of this, we're, we're nothing. And the psalmist, David, says that too. He said, you know, when I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? And, you know, you, you think about that. And you think, why would God even think on us? Why would he even be mindful of us? Why would he even care for us when you think about the, uh, all that is out there? Well, uh, this is what is a marvelous aspect of this psalm, is that God does care for us. And he shows that in this psalm. And this is one of the, the, the ways that we can learn and know about God. Yes, through natural revelation. Natural rev revelation is, is what we can see through creation. And it's absolutely amazing what you can find out through creation. Um, we were just uh, recently visiting my sister up in Washington, D.C. We went to the National um, History Museum. And uh, they have all kinds of interesting things to look at and see. And one of the displays was on DNA. And uh, if you ever studied through this aspect, it's literally amazing what you can learn through natural revelation, through what God has revealed in DNA. You think of one tiny little cell that you might have. You can't even see your cell, but within each cell is a nucleus. Within each of the nucleus, you have the DNA. And if you were to uncoil that DNA, uh, just one little part of that DNA that makes you up, the code that is there, that, that is written, that, that uh, makes each individual person, you uncoil that tiny little DNA, and it's six feet long. And they've got that right there on the, the display in the natural history. 
How does anyone look at that and say, you know, this evolved? I mean, it's impossible when you think about the complexity, the design that God has. And, and when you look at all of creation from, from the, the galaxies that are there down to the DNA, you see a God who is there. But again, you think, why? How does God care for me? Natural revelation doesn't reveal that. Natural revelation tells us that there is an awesome God who is there. He's a God who is all-powerful, almighty, uh, a God who is, is uh, omniscient and everywhere present. You can learn a lot about God from natural revelation, but special revelation, God's word, goes further, and it tells us even further. And so David asks, what is man that you're mindful of him, or the son of man that you would care for him? Well, that's where this psalm tells us that, yes, God is a mighty God. And we stand back and we say, how majestic, how awesome is your name when we see creation. But we also see that God does care for us. And as you look at uh, even verse 2, he says, Out of the mouths of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. You know, Jesus in the New Testament quoted this verse. He quoted this when the Pharisees and the scribes uh, looked at uh, and heard what the people were saying as he came into Jerusalem. And it was his triumphal entry and the children and others were all crying out, Hosanna to the Lord, glory to God in the highest. And uh, the, the, the scribes and Pharisees, they said, you know, make these um, people stop saying that. You shouldn't allow that. It's blasphemous. They shouldn't allow to be say that. And Jesus was, was telling them, and he quoted this verse. He also said that if they were to, to stop their mouths, even the rocks would cry out uh, um, in glory to him. And so out of the mouths of, of babies and infants, uh, God has established his strength. His, his strength, is, is, his praise has is, is gone forth from even the, these children. You know, God uses the, the weak things and the base things and the things which are not to confound the wise. And this God who is this incredible God who's created this infinite universe, he does care about us. And he's talking about babes and sucklings. But not only that, as you see, he asked the question, what, well, how do you even care for man? Uh, listen to how the author of the book of Hebrews applies this. This is a, a text that's messianic as the author of the book of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter quotes these verses, these exact verses that you've made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. And what the author to the book of Hebrews does is say this is Jesus Christ. He's talking about the incarnation. He's talking about how the God who created the world became a man. He added a human nature to his own nature. And that is amazing to think about. Uh, just from a, a physical standpoint, the immensity of the universe, and we're just a tiny speck here, and yet God is not limited by time or space. Um, to, to, to God, uh, the intimate relationship that he has with man is, is not bound by space and, and, and even by time. God enters into this world and he took upon him. He added to his own nature a human nature. And we marvel at that, don't we? Uh, at Christmas time, often we, we think about how in the world, wow, God, he added to his, his own nature a human nature. He became a man, and there he is as a babe, uh, swaddled in a manger. And we think, that is amazing. That is awesome. And so the psalmist is... By, by revelation, revealing these things already, even before it happened, that yes, he did take upon him the form of a man. So the answer to this question, what is man that you're mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him, is the incarnation. He became, he took upon him the form of a man. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. As I mentioned at the beginning of this uh, reading, that this psalm is addressed to God. 
14 times uh, the word you or your is used of God in this text. And so it's a song. It's, it's almost a psalm. It's a psalm, but it's like a song that's addressed to God. And David takes the time to acknowledge God personally for who he is. He was overwhelmed by God. He was overwhelmed as he looked at the stars. And yet he saw himself as nothing, but yet he wonders and he looks to the Lord. You know, science will continue to have greater and greater discoveries, not only in astronomy, but in other areas of biology. And uh, it's an interesting topic for many people to, to look at that. And you think uh, in the universities that are all over uh, the country, there are uh, students that are studying uh, the most uh, obscure worm, but not only the most obscure worm, they're studying a protein that's in that particular obscure worm. And you can look in the libraries across the world and you'll see people studying and looking at nature. And they're, 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 they're looking and they're, they're finding awesome and incredible things that are there. And yet often they're doing it not knowing that they're seeing God's creation. And that's one thing about natural revelation. As you look at it, you can see who God is. I think we as believers, we see and we know and understand who God is. But an unbeliever, as they look at that, uh, their eyes are blinded. They don't see who God is and what he has done. They, they, they look at that, and the Bible says they're without excuse. Uh, revelation has been given to them, Romans chapter 1 and verse 20. Maybe we can look at that briefly. God's revelation has been, been given to them, and what do they do with that? Romans chapter 1. For the wrath of God, it says in verse 18, is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. The truth. That's what people need today. They're, they may not realize it, but they are searching for the truth. And the truth is there, but they suppress it. What can be known about God, it says, is plain to them. Why? Because God has shown it to them. God is showing people through creation who he is. And he says, for his invisible power, uh, I'm sorry, for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world. They're there, and yet their minds are blinded. They don't see that but they're clearly perceived. Although they knew God, what happened? They did not honor him as God or give thanks to them. They became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Instead of turning to the Lord, they turned to other things and as fools, they, they turned away from God. And in the end, they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal men, birds and animals and creeping things. And they ended up serving the creature rather than the creator. The creator is clearly seen. Across the world this morning even, people woke up and they said, let's go see the sunset. And there are a number of places around the world where you can see a beautiful sunset. Uh, you can go to the Grand Canyon, or you can go to some other um, special places where people are there. And, and I don't know if you've ever been there, but as the sun goes down and it's all finished, people actually start applauding the, the sun as it goes down or as it comes up. And who are they applauding or what are they applauding? I think they don't realize there's a search within them for God. And they don't realize it, but God is there. I'm giving a number of illustrations from, from natural revelation because I think every one of us realize and see that as well. I don't know if when you became a believer, you, you actually just somehow saw the trees differently. You saw the birds differently. You saw a grasshopper differently. You saw God's creation and you looked at it and you said, now I know the author behind it all. You actually see it and, and know it and you rejoice in it. And this is actually what the psalmist is doing. But people across this world, um, I can remember I was in, uh, uh, had to go to the hospital in 
um, in France for a problem I had with a heart. It ended up being just a crick in my back, but it really mimicked a heart problem, and they never found anything, but I was in a bed next to a guy who claimed to be an atheist, and I, I appreciated uh, um, a fellow believer came in to visit me, and he started talking to this man, and he said, um, you know, um, do you believe in God? And he says, no, I'm an atheist. And he says, well, are you convinced? Are you a convinced atheist? And the guy said, well, no. And that opened the door. And so this man uh, started to, to explain to him, well, are you willing to learn more about what you may not know and understand? And the guy said, yes. And so he was able to, to go further with him. But as I was talking with this man, he loved nature. He would be out in his boat fishing when he had the opportunity. He, he talked about the different birds that were there. He talked about the different animals that you could see, the different fish that were in. He knew all their names. And it was like all this interest in nature. Why? What for? And I think, again, God is revealing himself to, to people. They're without excuse, but nature can be uh, a stepping stone for somebody to come to know even God further. And for us who know the Lord, um, you know, nature is a wonderful way that we can also learn more about who our God is. Uh, it's, it's limited. We don't know everything about God uh, through, through nature. Uh, special revelation, God's word is what shows that to us. Psalm 19 is a wonderful example of this, where it starts off by simply saying, uh, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows forth his handiwork. Day unto day pours forth speech, speech, night unto night reveals knowledge. And so it's like day after day after day, God is, is speaking. He's speaking to the world. And then the psalm goes on and it talks about the word of the Lord. And he, he mentions different aspects of God's word. And that's what we have for us as well. Uh, I was looking at a few statistics about the national parks. Over a million people visit the Great Woods, uh, the Great Redwoods, every year. Um, four and a half million people flock to the Grand Canyon in 2021. Five million people to Yellowstone. Eight million people a year visit the Niagara Falls. Sixteen million people visit the Blue Ridge Parkway. Fourteen million visited the Great Smoky Mountains uh, National Park. And you can go across the United States, you can go across the world, the Iguazu Falls in Argentina, or you can go to Kruger National Park in, in South Africa. Uh, 2.5 million people visit Iceland. Why do they do that? That's an incredibly awesome place to visit. Um, but uh, we as believers have the privilege of knowing the Creator. And it's interesting, as you look at this psalm and as you look at other texts in the scriptures, the Creator is often mentioned, our Creator, our Maker. Um, often it's used in relationship to prayer as well. You can think of a, a text in the book of Acts where the, the believers were persecuted. And as they were being persecuted, Peter uh, was threatened by these men and said that you uh, cannot speak anymore in in this name of Jesus. And we know Peter's reply was, I can't but speak. I have to tell others about this. And so they threatened him again. And then in his prayer, uh, Peter prays, Lord, behold their threatenings. But before he said that, he said, creator of heaven and earth, you who are the creator of all things, behold their threatenings. Grant us boldness that we may go even further and preach the gospel. And, you know, God answered that prayer, we know, because there was an earthquake that shook at that moment. And it was a way that God was saying, yes, I am the creator of the ends of the earth, and I will grant you this boldness to continue to preach the gospel. Satan has blinded the minds of them which believe not. And that brings us to this missions aspect of this message. You might be wondering, you're a missionary, should be preaching us a missions message. Well, we know that Satan is the one who has blinded the minds of those which believe not, lest they should see the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God. Um, what people need are their eyes to be opened. Eyes to be opened not only to the Creator, but to Jesus Christ who came to this world, who 
became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians 4 says this, For, for God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, he shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Let light shine out of darkness. Let there be light. That brings us back to Genesis, doesn't it? Genesis chapter 1 in the creation. Let there be light. And, and uh, Paul uses that as an illustration of what needs to happen in each heart, where God enables them to see the light of the gospel. And it's in, in the face of Jesus Christ, as he mentions. Without God shining in their hearts, uh, people can't see. They, they're blinded. And I think many of us who, who were unsaved, we realize that. We, we grew up in a church, perhaps, and you went to church. I, I grew up in a, in a Lutheran church family. I was baptized as an infant and later confirmed at the age of 13. I believed in my head that Jesus died on the cross and that he rose again. I believed that here in my head, but there was never a personal application of that to my heart until I came to Christ in my freshman year at Clemson University. Uh, there, somebody came by my dorm. I'd already been attending some Bible studies. It was actually my wife, Carol, that introduced me to, to the Bible in a sense of being a real book that you can actually read. Uh, she invited me to a prayer meeting in high school before school even started. They opened the Bible and they prayed. And I saw that these uh, friends of mine had a relationship with God that I did not have. I started searching and looking in the Bible for, for truth. And so the culmination of this was my freshman year at Clemson. I had been reading the Bible, I had been attending church, and a guy, he comes to me and he says, Walter, you know, if you were to die tonight, come before the gates of heaven. And someone were there and he were to say, Walter, why should I allow you to come into heaven here? And for me, it was a perfect question because I, I needed to think about, well, what was I leaning on? What was I trusting in? What was it that I was putting my full faith and trust in? And I said, well, I think because of Jesus. And uh, he sensed the hesitancy, and he said, you know, that's true. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. But he said, but Walter, do you know Christ as your Savior? Do you know him? And uh, he showed me John 1.12. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And that simple um, explanation of what it means to receive Christ was something that just opened my eyes because I saw Christ before as someone who died on the cross and I said, well all the world's going to be saved but then I realized I needed to personally trust in him and to believe in him to repent of my sins and to ask him to save me from my sins and I can remember uh, he didn't ask me or force me into a prayer uh, he just said Walter why don't you take care of that before you go to sleep uh, tonight. And so there I was, John Stone D608, a dormitory that night before I go to bed. I, I simply was honest before the Lord and I asked him to save me. And I can remember the, uh, the change that came about in my life after that and a desire to learn more uh, about who, who this God is that has saved me. It's, it's, it's a testimony I think we all have where we, we our eyes were opened. People, God used people to bring the gospel. God used this time to read the word of God. God used someone to, to help me uh, to see certain truths, but it was God who did that, who opened my heart and my eyes. And it's a, it's a privilege that we all have to be able to bring the gospel to others and to realize that the power of God unto salvation is there in the gospel, simply. We just let it do what it's meant to do. You present the gospel, and it has power to save men and women and children from sin. God shining the gospel in their hearts to see the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. This psalm, a wonderful psalm, tells us about the majesty and glory of God that we see in heaven and that we see on earth. And then he goes on to tell us that it's this creator of all things, he was made a little lower than the angels, yet crowned with glory and honor. 
And you see this picture of, of Jesus Christ crowned with glory and honor. He's reigning. He's ruling over all things. Over all things. He's ruling and he's sovereign. And yet, the psalm doesn't bring this out. But of course, we know in the New Testament that before he was crowned with glory and honor, he gave of himself. He died in our place upon the cross. The Son of Man who, who, who died for us and gave himself for us. And so we know from the book of Revelation that we'll be singing this, Worthy are you, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. We'll be singing that, but we'll also be singing glory to the Lamb that was slain, that was given for us. We have no right to enter into heaven, but Jesus Christ has provided the way of salvation through his Son. He became sin for us who knew no sin. This is Christ's substitutionary atonement. He died in our place. He gave himself for us. Even as Isaiah 53 talks about, that he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. All we like sheep have gone astray. Everyone has turned his own way, and yet the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He did that for us. The creator of the universe added a human nature to himself, and he died in our place, and he's reversing the curse, the curse that came about in Genesis chapter 3, and now the possibility for salvation is open to all through our Lord. Again, I come back to this idea of missions. People need to see the light of the gospel. Their eyes and heart need to be open. God uses each of us to do that. But there's another aspect that I see here as well. This God who is over all, who has been given dominion over the work of your hands, all things are put under his feet. That reminds us also of the Great Commission, doesn't it? Where he begins and simply says, all authority is given unto me in heaven and on earth. Go ye therefore. And that's a tremendous comfort to any missionary, to anybody who's going out to witness to others, to realize that God is over all things. He is the God who ordains relationships. He directs us to people. He has put you in your neighborhood. He has brought us to France after a transition from Cameroon for 18 years. And now we see God's hand in, in having us where we are right now in France. But for each of us individually, God has directed us where we are. You were born into a particular family. Why were you there? Now that you're a believer, you have a, a special place to be able to bring the gospel to others. God is over all. His sovereignty rules and reigns over all. He rules over world, over wars and over sickness and over cancer and over other things. He is over it all. And we can have confidence that he is there. And we see that throughout the Bible. You can look at the word creator or crea uh, the word creator in, in the Bible. It's tremendous encouragement to see our creator. Uh, listen to these verses from Isaiah 40. To whom will you liken me, or shall I be equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high, and behold who hath created these things, that bring out their hosts by number. He calleth them all by names, by the greatness of the might, of his might. For he is strong in power, not one faileth. Again, looking at the stars, not one fails. He calls them all by names. Every one of those billion and billions of stars that, that with billions and billions of galaxies, he knows them all by name. There's an intimacy with which God knows every single star, and yet how much more he knows every single aspect of our lives. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. In Isaiah 40, he goes on to say, Why sayest thou, O Jacob, and speakest, O Israel, my way is hid from the Lord, and my judgment is passed over from my God. You know, we're tempted to do that. We say, Lord, you don't know me. I mean, why, why is it that I, you don't seem to, to, to know I'm even existing here? And so, so this, uh, Isaiah is saying, why are you saying that? God, he is strong in power and might. He is over all these things. He goes on to say, have you not known, have you not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, faints not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. 
He gives power to the faint. And to them that has no might, he increases strength. You think of the incredible power of this universe that is there. And even in a single atom, the power that is there. And, we, and, and it's as though the, uh, the Lord is saying through Isaiah here, there's no searching of his understanding. And he gives power to the faint. And he may not give that power in the way we think he, he will give it, as though there would be some atlas power and strength that we would have, but he gives power to the faint. As you go through those trials and, 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 and it, the incredible and difficult things that you pass through, and yet you see that God is lifting you up through that, that's the creator of the ends of the earth that is doing that. And so as we, as we close this morning, as we try to simply apply this to our own lives, uh, let's do what David did and simply sing in praise to our Lord. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You've set your glory above the heavens. And the, the, the question that is asked, what is man that you're mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? We can respond and say, Lord, you care for me. You loved me. You gave yourself for me. And what a blessing to know that if we cast all our cares on him, he cares for us. The God of the universe cares. And he has given us the privilege of caring for others. God put within our heart a love for someone, a love for uh, an enemy, uh, a love for, for another, and it's, it's the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth that does that. And he gives strength. He gives power to each of us. So may the Lord help us as we meditate on, on this psalm, even this afternoon, and later on that we will remember our creator, the creator of the ends of the earth, and that he cares and that he's mindful for each of us. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the encouragement that we can receive uh, from this text, this natural revelation that is mentioned, but also this special revelation that you have presented yourself through Jesus Christ to each of us. And what a privilege that you've given us to know you, the God of the universe, the creator of all. And we thank you. We thank you, Lord, that you added a human nature to your nature and that you died in our place. You gave of yourself. We know the wages of sin are death, but we thank you for the gift, your gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Help us to be encouraged on this day that you, the creator of the ends of the earth, you give power to them that lack power. You open the eyes of those that are blinded and help us to trust you and to walk with you throughout this day and throughout this week, recognizing and um, praising you for your excellent and majestic name that's in all this earth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.